because this hand is meant to represent a single mortgage bond. Okay, Selena has a pretty good hand here, showing 18, dealer showing seven. That's a really good hand for Selena. Good odds. In fact, your chances of winning this hand are 87%. So my odds are good. I'm on a winning streak. Everybody in this place wants to get in on the action. How could I lose, right? Now, this is a classic error. In basketball, it's called the hot hand fallacy. A player makes a bunch of shots in a row. People are sure they're going to make the next one. People think whatever's happening now is going to continue to happen into the future. During the real estate boom, markets were going up and up, and people thought they would never go down. So people who are watching and think that I won't lose will make a side bet. Now, this is the first synthetic CD. I love Selena Gomez. I bet you 50 million she wins. And I'll give you a three to one odds. Three to one odds? Okay, I'll take that bet. Now, somebody else is going to want to make a bet on the outcome of their bet. 50 million she wins. That will lead to synthetic CDO number two. Hey, I bet you 200 million that lady in the glasses wins that bet. She probably will win. So I want great payoff. How about 21? Deal. 
and this will go on and on with more and more synthetic CDs. And we can transform an original $10 million investment into billions of dollars. You okay? No. I actually feel pretty sick. <laughs> I'm going to you think I'm a parasite, don't you, Mr. Wayne? But apparently society values me very much. In fact, let's do this. I'll tell you how much I'm worth. You tell me how much you're worth. God, you are an incredibly big piece of shit. So that right there, my friends, is the story of today. That was a clip from The Big Short. Many of you all have seen it. Many of you maybe have not seen that yet. But that movie is an epic depiction of the housing collapse during the great financial crisis and the shadow banking that occurred during that time. For those of you who followed us during the primaries uh, and <clears throat> Bernie Sanders campaign, you saw Hillary and Bernie fight tooth and nail about reinstating Glass-Steagall and her and her smug ha-ha-ha saying, well, Glass-Steagall doesn't touch shadow banking and so forth. So what I've done is because we typically talk purely about modern monetary theory and we focus largely on enabling a new deal, we have decided that it was very important to provide some perspective on this phenomenon known as shadow banking, and also to kind of disabuse folks of the notions, the fallacious notions about the Federal Reserve. They do an awful lot of bad things, but they do an awful lot of good things too, and they're a needed piece of this component. So what I've done is I've brought in Cornell Law, so Robert Hockett, who let me bring right now onto the camera. Welcome to Real Progressives, uh, Bob. How are you today, sir? Hey, Steve. I'm fine. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, Bob, what I want to do is have you just take a moment to explain who you are and what you do, and maybe even talk a little bit about your time in the Occupy movement. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank, well, thanks for asking. I'm the Edward Cornell Professor of Law over at Cornell Law School, and there I specialize in finance and financial regulation, uh, as well as the law of money. Uh, I got there uh, by a sort of, um, I suppose, a circuitous route, uh, but that route might say a little bit, it might offer a little bit of explanation, I suppose, as to why I sort of come at things the way that I do. So I was doing a doctoral degree in economics way back when uh, and was sort of um, troubled, as many people are, by the orthodoxy that seemed to be prevalent uh, in the academy. So I took some time off to spend a little bit of time uh, figuring out what I wanted to write my dissertation on uh, exactly uh, after having finished the coursework. Uh, and during that time, I started working under a bridge with a bunch of homeless guys just to sort of figure out why they were homeless. And a couple of interesting uh, things sort of emerged from that experience. One was that these guys didn't have any access to banking services. And so although they made a lot of money detailing cars, washing cars, squeegeeing windows and the like, they couldn't save any. Uh, and that got me sort of wondering why it is that we don't have financial services of any sort. Uh, for folk who aren't at the top of the income and uh, wealth distributions. Uh, the other thing that was kind of interesting was they had sort of a business uh, in a way, right? They have essentially had kind of replicated uh, the idea of a kibbutz uh, under the bridge. And so I started referring to us as a kind of homeless kibbutz. Uh, and that got me wondering why we don't have that as one of our business forms. And so basically I started thinking about uh, sort of the, the, the nexus, I guess you could say, between law, uh, productive activity, uh, and finance. Uh, and thought, well, maybe that's what I should do my doctoral work in ultimately, or maybe that's what my dissertation should ultimately be on. Uh, so I ended up getting a law degree, then finishing up my doctoral work in finance. Um, and then I did a bit of work over at the IMF and over at the New York Fed, uh, in addition to becoming a legal academic. Uh, during the occupation uh, in the autumn of 2011, uh, I was actually working over at the New York Fed for half of each week. Uh, and so I would be working there during the day and then I would camp out over at Zuccotti Park, uh, which is just, as you know, a couple blocks away uh, in the evenings. And that made for some rather uh, interesting uh, conversations, you might say, whereas you know, in the sense that on the one hand, I was camping there because I thought the same way that everybody there thought, um, at least as uh, at least when it comes to sort of the role of finance in our particular economy and in our society. Uh, 
Uh, but on the other hand, of course, I also did uh, believe in, at, the, at the very least in the potential uh, that the New York Fed in particular, but also the Fed system more generally has to do good. Uh, and so we had a lot of interesting conversations, uh, needless to say, by night about what the uh, Fed does, what its role is, um, where it falls short, where it could do better uh, and so forth. So that's, I guess, how I ended up uh, here <laughs> on your on your wonderful program. Steve, I'm sorry, I've lost your sound. It's my fault. I was muting out. Oh, gotcha. OK. One of the things that's amazing to me as as we look at that clip is the the overt smugness, the the callous um, deafness, if you will, of society around them falling apart as they're just raking in, vacuuming up money as the entire system is about to implode, as Mark Baum so definitely notes in that clip. Yeah. What about the, uh, the repeal of Glass-Steagall and things like that? If any, did it have to set up this shadow banking world? I mean, for, maybe better yet, let's. Can you define shadow banking for our audience so they understand what it's all about? Right. Yeah. So I think maybe the best way to think about shadow banking um, is by focusing on one particular aspect of it that renders it reminiscent of banking. Uh, and then look at the other feature of it that renders it a shadowy form of, of banking, if you will. So that which supposedly makes it banking is the fact that you've essentially got a kind of endogenous money creation going on. You've got a sort of endogenous credit uh, expansion going on. And the way that it happens is that you essentially have an infrastructure whereby some people are able to borrow very short and then to quote unquote invest uh, or to lend uh, or to uh, speculate long, right? So basically anytime I'm able to say, get short term credit from you, let's say you lend me uh, a certain sum of money for a day, and then I can use that money to invest in something, some asset or some supposed asset that doesn't mature until quite a bit later, um, we've got essentially a, the so-called maturity mismatch there. I'm borrowing short in order to lend or invest long. The thing that makes it possible, of course, is that you have to be willing to keep rolling over the debt that I owe to you, right? If you've lent to me for one day, the following day, my debt is due to you, but you say, okay, you can keep it for another day. You'll just pay me a little bit more uh, in the way of interest or whatever my borrowing cost is. And then you roll it over on the third day and on the fourth day and on the fifth day and so on. You keep rolling it over. But you're in, on any given day, you can refrain from or you can refuse to roll it over and just go ahead and call in the loan, so to speak. And in that sense, your lending to me is not unlike what happens when somebody deposits money in a bank in the form of a demand deposit. At least that's the idea. Um, and what that means is that I'm borrowing from you short term in that particular sense. And that means in turn that I have to pay you comparatively low borrowing costs, right? A very low interest rate or very low uh, borrowing costs in whatever form they take. In the meanwhile, I'm investing, quote unquote, in a longer form. And that means, of course, that I can recover more. I can take more in the form of interest or in the way of borrowing charges from whomever I'm lending to or from whomever I'm investing in, or maybe I should say whatever I'm investing in. And that means in turn then that what I'm essentially doing is legging the spread, as they say on Wall Street. Basically, I'm borrowing cheap and I'm lending more expensively. And my entire business model is based on basically capitalizing on or recouping the spread between those two rates. Now, that's the way we typically look at or the way people typically look at uh, ordinary banking institutions or depository institutions. The idea is, you know, you and I put money in, we deposit the money. Um, and in that sense, we're lending short term because we can always take the money out. So if it's a demand deposit, we can, in effect, refrain from rolling over the debt um, that the bank has to us at any given moment. The bank, for its part, makes longer term investments. And so it basically capitalizes on the same spread. At least that's the picture that people typically have of banks. Uh, and that's in turn, then, why so-called shadow banking looks like banking to these people. It's worth noting as a quick aside that that's not actually an accurate picture of what banks do, um, as I'm sure many of my friends and colleagues and your friends and colleagues in the MMT movement uh, 
uh, have made clear. That's not banks don't borrow and lend, but but we tend to think of banks as doing that. That's the sort of popular vision uh, of what banks do. And so um, whenever some other institution does something that kind of is reminiscent of that picture of banking, but isn't regulated as a bank, they call it shadow banking. Uh, now that of course takes me to the shadow piece of the story, uh, and that's a fairly simple piece. That's actually much easier to get across than the than the banking piece of this description. And that is, it, we call it shadow banking essentially because it's not regulated as banking, right? It's not looked, it's not policed, or it hasn't been policed in the way that banking uh, traditionally has been. In particular, with a view to its uh, liquidity uh, risk, right? I mean, we don't want it ever to come to pass that a bank isn't able to pay out to its depositors if they all decide to withdraw at the same time, or if a bunch of them decide to withdraw at the same time, or if a bunch of people are writing, uh, drawing on their accounts in the banks at the same time. Uh, and so we uh, we regulate the banks very carefully with a view to their liquidity, and we also, of course, regulate their portfolios. We we tell them what they might, what they may, and what they may not invest in. Uh, and of course, we require them to hold capital, so-called capital buffers against those asset portfolios as well. The thing that makes shadow banking shadow banking is precisely the fact that we don't actually do that uh, with those institutions. Uh, and so in effect, they are doing what we tend to think of banks as doing, but without any of the strings attached that are designed to kind of maintain the safety and soundness uh, of the industry. Is that is that more or less clear? Oh, sorry, Absolutely. I, I think the, the irony for me is, is that <clears throat> I've come into this world through a, through a different angle, right? I didn't focus as much on the finance side and on the Wall Street portion of this. I really focused on the, the uh, currency issuer versus currency user, the paradigm of our federal government, and it's serving our needs. And then you have this dare I say, you know, uh, casino uh, economy over here that they're gambling on all of our lives. I mean, it's like they're watching our, our decisions and laying money on whether we're going to you know, live or die, basically. Um, at least that's that's kind of what I'm hearing. I mean, that's salacious, probably. It's probably just a little bit more salacious than it need be. But point is, is that I'm what I see here is largely a gambling economy that has nothing to do with creating anything of use, right. nothing useful whatsoever coming from it, other than people creating more and more and more and more money, uh, mm -hmm. basically from, from these gambles. Yeah, so I think you're exactly right about that. And, and, and actually that's sort of the, the thing that comes across to me first before anything else does when watching that clip that you opened with is just how remarkable it is, what, what a remarkable irony it is that this particular that this thing is even possible, right? That what happens, are, that the story that's being told or that's being conveyed in that clip is even possible. There's a kind of contradiction in the middle of it, and here's what I mean: all of that sort of complex uh, synthetic financial instrument building is done, in theory at least, the claim or the the justification that's typically proffered for it is that you want to be able, you want it to be the case that those who are most able to bear risk will bear that risk, and those who are least able to bear risk will be able to shed that risk. And so you divvy up various pools of securities and cut them up into tranches, and basically those tranches are understood by reference to their comparative risk properties, right? So you want the riskiest tranche to be invested in by those who are most able to afford to bear that risk. And of course they demand a higher return at risk bearing. And then you want those who uh, have the lowest risk tolerance to be able to buy the lowest risk tranches of those particular pooled securities or pooled assets, whatever they might be, whether they be mortgages or anything else. And the whole idea then, the entire premise behind the idea uh, I mean, the entire premise behind the phenomenon of securitization and then synthesis, synthesis of various kinds of derivative financial instrument is that you have to be able to, uh, again, sort of cater to the differing risk tastes of various investors. But now here's the kicker. Here's where this gets ironic. That entire idea, the idea that it's a compelling need to be able to sort of cater to the different risk tastes of different investors is predicated on an error. And the error is that, well, we have a shortage of capital out there, that we live in a world of capital shortage or money shortage or finance capital shortage. 
whichever of those terms you want to use, the idea is that credit is somehow scarce, that finance capital is somehow scarce. And so in order to optimize the availability of credit, which we assume private parties are the ones to extend, we create these secondary markets in which people can buy and sell securities that have already been issued, or in which people can buy and sell different kinds of security that bear different kinds of risk in order to optimize or maximize those private capital suppliers' participation in the financial markets in the first place. That's a long-winded way of saying that we explain or we try to justify the existence of the secondary markets, including the derivative markets, which I guess you could think of as tertiary or uh, quaternary or whatever, you know, n nth markets. We always try to justify those markets on the theory that they make the primary markets, right, the, the, the initial credit extension markets more liquid, that they bring more credit into the economy that otherwise wouldn't be there. But now that is crap, of course, because as we all know, the economy is not in any sense faced with conditions of capital scarcity. There is no such scarcity. And indeed, there hasn't been for ages, assuming that there ever was. And in a certain sense, the people in that clip understood this, and they knew this as well, because shadow banking just is one of the reasons why we don't have capital scarcity. The shadow banking markets are, in a certain sense, proof that there is no such thing as capital scarcity because they are proof that money or credit money, maybe we should use that term instead, credit dash money, that credit money is endogenous, as the post-Keynesians put it, right? That there is no such shortage. So there's a contradiction in the middle of that clip in the sense that all of these instruments that they're talking about are justified by reference to their optimization of the availability of credit in the primary markets where credit actually is useful. And yet they themselves have to know that there is no such shortage of credit that would justify the need of those particular instruments, given the fact that they themselves are engaged in shadow banking, meaning that they themselves are living embodiments of the endogeneity of the credit money supply. You bring up a great point, and it's one that I want to touch on. And this is something that even some of the more experienced MMTers get wrong, and I'm one of them. Can you please explain to our audience the, the facets of exogenous money creation and endogenous money creation and why it is so vital to understand the difference between the two? Because it appears to me that people really do confuse, and I'm really grateful that you broke it out as credit money versus mm -hmm. just you know net financial assets based money, for, you know currency straight from the government, et cetera. Can you just take a few minutes and ex explain that? Yeah, so I think the easiest way to do this is to think of the endogenous element as the private element and think of the exogenous element as the sovereign element, okay? So, and here's what I mean. Um, maybe the best way to explain that or sort of map this out is by reference to a typical bank lending transaction. And you've probably seen this before. Uh, so a bank decides whether or not to make a loan to somebody not by going and checking the vault or making sure that they have enough reserves on hand or whatever to ensure that they can actually uh, that they actually have the money to lend out. They basically make the decision on the basis of whether they think that the loan is going to prove profitable. And so a bank is actually, in theory, able to make a loan even if it has no deposits at all. And it, if you want a kind of dramatic, uh, I suppose, proof of this or, or sort of object lesson in this, Note how across most of the English speaking world outside of the United States, banks don't even face reserve limits any longer or reserve required reserves, reserve requirements, we should say, any longer. Uh, and here in the States, reserve requirements don't kick in until quite late. So what a, what a bank does is it endogeny, endogenously, as it were, extends credit to things it can make a profit off of lending to. Then the exogenous element comes in when the sovereign elects either to recognize or not recognize that particular loan. Now, recognition here takes various forms, right? One form is simply even to allow it, right? If it's regulatorily permissible for the institution to make the loan, then of course it's permissible and it's quote unquote recognized. Furthermore, if for example, uh, a bank makes a loan to you simply by opening or crediting a, an account in your name, and you're able to draw on that account by writing a check or making a payment out of it to somebody, and then whoever you make it to deposits that payment into his or her own account, 
And then the Fed here in the States or the Central Bank or Monetary Authority in some other jurisdiction is prepared to recognize and clear that particular draft, to clear that check, then that's another form of recognition. It's what we call accommodation. Here in the States, the Fed accommodates bank loans as long as those loans meet particular criteria. And there too, there's a kind of exogenous element, at least relative to the private sector, because the sovereign has the power either to recognize or not recognize, or to accommodate or not accommodate that particular extension of credit. Now, note that that means then that insofar as there's ex exogeneity here, this is only exogeneity relative to the private sector because there is this public element, there's this sovereign element that determines what the limits are. Note, however, by the same token, that relative, to, as far as the sovereign itself is concerned, there's no ex exogeneity at all other than the so-called resource constraint that our colleagues in the MMT movement point to, right? In other words, there's no natural constraint on how much credit the, the, the Fed or the federal government more broadly can recognize as being permissible for banks or other lenders to extend or i.e. or create or generate. There's no natural limit to that other than the inflation constraint, which of course, as you know, is a derivative off of the resource constraint. But apart from that, there's not even an exogenous constraint on the sovereign. But insofar as there's any exogenous constraint, it's a constraint faced by the private sector that is imposed by the sovereign when the sovereign is doing its job, right? And one way to think of this, what you might you might know this, I mean, I've been sort of pushing around for a while or, or kind of pushing for some years now, uh, a certain metaphor that I think is very helpful when it comes to sort of comprehending what's going on here. Uh, I call the system a sort of franchise system where the sovereign is the franchisor, uh, the various private lending institutions or private uh, financial institutions are franchisees. And what they're charged with doing is distributing what amounts to a public resource, namely the sovereign's monetized full faith and credit. And in effect, that's what's going on. Anytime the Fed, quote unquote, accommodates or recognizes a bank loan or a loan extended by any other institution, anytime it does that, it is effectively turning a private liability into a public liability and doing it in monetized form. And so in that sense, you can think of this as a case where you've got a franchisor that's essentially outsourcing the distribution of its resource to these private institutions. But if it's not fully cognizant that it has that role and that that's what it's meant to be doing, that it's meant to be exercising quality control at the same time that it's allowing this purveying to go on, then of course things, you know, you're likely to get a defective product out there. And that's sort of what happened, of course, in the lead up to 2008. That may have been the best explanation <laughs> I have ever had in my life. And, I, and I'll tell you why. Aside from the obvious, you know, we're, we're riddled, unfortunately. What has happened over the course of time is the libertarian strain of the world has infected the progressive movement. Hmm. And not necessarily in terms of ethos, but in terms of tales from the fire pit and the bar stool that have overcome common sense. And I will give them this much. The explanation prior to your analogy that you just made um, that's a lot to take in. If you're not a, an economically minded, financially minded, educated person that has been through countless book studies and tests and so forth, research, that's a lot to absorb. Yeah. But that idea of the sovereign franchising itself out and distributing it, but not really understanding its own quality control component is a fin like, I'm going to hold on to that for dear life because that right there really put a lot in, in play for me. It, oh, it's good, very frustrating. You. As you and I spoke offline, it's extremely frustrating to work with people that are dead set in this concept of, you know, the U.S. is now in chains and, and is now owned by Jewish banksters. And, and they've got this long laundry list of anti-Semitic drivel that comes through the door. And, you know, I, they talk about the Rothschilds and I'm like, what are you going to do? Put a bar of soap in their tub and make them slip on it? You're going to spike their Earl Grey? What are you going to do? Stop. There's always going to be rich people. There's always going to be some power struggle. This is our world. This is where we're at right now. It would be better to understand how it really is than make up tales from the fire pit, do, you know, hieroglyphics on caves. Why, you know, it, it's better just to learn the truth because the truth is how we win. Telling yeah. stories, you can't act on storytelling. You, you tell yeah. myths and legends, there's no actionable anything there. 
Yeah, there's a there's a sort of a, a really sort of disturbing irony, I think, that comes from the importance of the secondary markets in, in any financial system uh, these days. And I think in this particular, well, the, the, the importance of the secondary markets is itself, I think, a product of a gross maldistribution of wealth in our societies. So people at the top of the distribution are the investing class or the rentier class, as Keynes would have called them. Most of us who aren't at the top of the distribution are not of that class. Um, all of this uh, sort of extra money that can't be consumed, or all of this extra wealth that can't possibly be consumed by those who hold it, gets invested in the so-called secondary markets. Um, and that, of course, leads to all sorts of uh, complexification of financial instruments because everybody's always trying to come up with something new that hasn't been marketed to these people before in order that to, to be able to earn higher rents on yet a new financial, on yet another new financial innovation. And what that does is it makes finance look much more complex, much more difficult to uh, track, much more intractable to the ordinary Jane or Joe than it needs to be. And what that in turn encourages then is for people to, you know, once they realize that something has gone wrong, but they can't quite put their finger on what it is precisely because of the complexity, they come up with a simplifying conspiracy theory. Uh, when in fact, there's a much better <laughs> conspiracy theory, I think, that we could all avail ourselves of. Um, but one upshot of this historically is, as you have doubtless noted through your, your own reading of, of financial history, Every time there's some sort of financial calamity of the kind that we uh, underwent in 1929 and after, and of course in 2008 and after, uh, it, these, these things always bring out a class of person you can think of as money cranks, right? Money cranks are kind of like gingivitis, right? If you're not brushing your teeth and, and washing your mouth with Listerine regularly, it kind of crops out. And money crankery comes out, you know, crops out, crops out any time there's some sort of crisis as well. And I think that the money cranks in a certain sense mean well, right? They, re again, they recognize that there's something really ugly going on. And they also recognize that there are people uh, who are very happy for us not to know the details because they know that the less that we know in the way of the details, the less likely they are to be scrutinized or regulated. But the, the sort of dark side of that then is that when people do recognize that there's something wrong, they come up with these, you know, very silly stories to try to explain it, like, oh, it's all the Rothschilds. Uh, I've heard this from so many well-meaning people. And, of course, I actually heard it from a lot of people in Zuccotti Park. And uh, when I was camping there, and part of my task at the time, I thought, is precisely to say, look, you guys, um, <laughs> there's a much better explanation for this. And it's actually, it's actually, things are actually worse than you think. We would be really, you know, we would be lucky if it were just the Rothschilds, right? Then we would know what to do, right? Um, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's not quite that it's not it's not that right it, 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 the, 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 it's it's much more sort of the problem is actually much more pervasive I fear than people realize that's not to say that it's more complex than people realize but it's much more pervasive than people realize I think so what I want to do is I want to just tease something up momentarily before I want to show another clip here in a minute okay. but one of the things that has really spoken to me I've been doing this since about 2009. Um, not this, but like learning MMT and and changing from a far right wing nut job who was one of those cranks, who was a Ron Paul guy, who was a gold bugger, who was an end the fetter, who was all those things. So I have experience and I feel perfectly adept at smacking my brothers and sisters for saying that silly stuff. The Alex Jones community, right? <laughs> so we, we, we get away from the idiocracy, and we start moving towards a more informed perspective that allows us to take action. And I've gotten to the point now, and maybe it's because I'm a parent and I've learned to tune out noise, yeah. but I've learned to tune out noise in this process as well, understanding that the single greatest thing that this system fears is an informed citizenry. Yeah. And if the citizens can but get rid of all the pedo gate stuff and stop talking about pizza gate and stop talking about all this stuff that they really can't do anything about pick up a good James Bond novel when they're bored to read. And let's focus on getting the sovereign to spend on the people. If we can take care of the people, then we can do a lot of eradicating of all the other noise that comes from a result of not taking care of the people. Yeah. Um, and, and so here we are as we, as we move forward and, I realize that we do need to reform banking in some way, shape or form. And maybe it is a reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. Maybe it is a modernized Glass-Steagall. Uh, maybe it's something that includes, uh, you know, reining in the shadow banking. Uh, but 
the reality is, and this is what I'm, I want to drive towards, anytime you put restrictions on things in, in the realm of which uh, people tend to do, these prohibition type you know, attitudes, what you end up getting is black markets. Mm-hmm. And when you get black markets, you, you end up with a whole different form of problem. I mean, you've got the, uh, these Panama papers and you've got all these other things showing what what what's happening behind the scenes that we're not capable of of having you know you know insight to and now all of a sudden we have insight to what does reform look like to you in in, in your perfect world and i mean obviously so this is a dissertation so if you, just keep it you know so that it's concise here but what would that look like to you what would be a good reform in your mind to bring about some sanity within banking and, and quite frankly bring our government up to speed on what its role is. Great, yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I think I would think in sort of functional terms, uh, which I guess we all do, right, when we're sort of thinking clearly. And I would sort of, I, I think the thing to do, the real key separation that I think has to be drawn is that between actual, uh, how should I call it, uh, institutions that really do function as franchise finance franchisees on the one hand, and all other financial institutions on the other. And here's here's what I mean by that. If you think, you know, that the dominant understanding of what finance is out there, and this connects up with this mistaken view of what banks do, is what you can think of as the intermediation view, or the inter, what I always call the intermediated scarce private capital view. So we have this tendency to think that financial institutions are basically go-betweens. They're middlemen, as we say, you know, standing between private suppliers of scarce capital on the one hand, and then private and sometimes public end users of that credit on the other hand. And so we tend to view financial institutions as not actually generating credit on their own or generating or issuing money on their own. That We just tend to look at them as the go-betweens. And I think they're actually oftentimes very pleased for us to view them that way. But in fact, what's really the case is that some financial institutions, namely those that are accommodated by or backed up by in any way, the Federal Reserve here in the States or counterpart central banks or monetary authorities in other jurisdictions, there are those institutions on the one hand, and that's those are the ones we can call the franchisee institutions precisely because they can generate new credit that will then be backed up by the public which means they are actually literally increasing the money supply on the one hand. And then the institutions that don't actually generate credit or generate new money, but simply do intermediate in the way that the financial intermediation story sort of has things on the other hand. The key problem I think that we've faced historically, particularly over the last century, and this is part of the th- part of what Blast Eagle was trying to end, is we oftentimes had the same institutions doing both of those things. And the reason, and that's very dangerous. And the reason for that is that when an institution that is catering to people who are up at the top of the income distribution, basically these so-called investors, these, but better, they should be, they would be better called speculators. When the same institutions that cater to the speculators and generate credit that they can send their way uh, on the one hand are also primary creditors to institutions that function in the real economy, like manufacturers or small businesses or what have you, on the other hand, that's where the danger happens. Because when those institutions then overextend credit, when they're not adequately monitored by the franchisor, and so the quality control suffers, and so a lot of bad credit gets extended, and then finally the the, the proverbial chickens come home to roost when the bubble bursts, it's not just the speculators who are affected. It's all of these firms in the real economy as well, and hence it's all of us who rely on them for jobs or for the provision of services or goods or so forth uh, who suffer uh, as well. So that basically all these externalities, these, these massive externalities occur when you have a crash. So I think the key thing to do is completely to separate all institutions that actually extend primary credit to the, in the primary markets, to actual home buyers or to actual small businesses, to actual producers of goods and services, separate them off from the institutions that act as actual intermediaries that don't actually generate credit, but in fact just intermediate between uh, people at the top of the income distribution and the wealth distribution who have money to invest on the one hand, 
and the end users of their investable funds on the other. So that then if there's too much dangerous activity that occurs in that second area, right, among the intermediaries, and things come a cropper for them and they fail, the rest of us over here in the real economy in the primary markets are just not affected by it in the way that we have been historically. I think that's ultimately what Glass-Steagall was meant to do. What Glass-Steagall did, as you know, is it tried to separate the depository institutions, banks in other words, which actually do work in these primary markets, which do lend to people like you and me when we want to buy homes or what have you on the one hand, from the high-end investment banks, the, the broker-dealer firms, the Goldman Sachs and so forth, on the other hand, that was the idea, is to separate out the, the, the institutions that facilitate speculation in the secondary markets from institutions that facilitate actual economic activity in the primary markets. In the old days, that was the depository institutions on the one hand and the broker-dealer firms on the other. Now it's not quite that simple, but the functional distinction remains just as simple as it always was. And it seems to me that the key thing to do then is to work the separation in that way, just to say, okay, no secondary market player is allowed to be also a primary market player and vice versa. The easiest way to do this, I think, would actually be to start experimenting at least with direct public provision of credit in the primary markets. In other words, you might remember in, um, I think it was at the end of chapter 12 of the general theory, Keynes had this, uh, there were two sort of, I think, uh, quotable or, or very memorable uh, lines. He had a real gift for the one-liner. Uh, but one one line that Keynes offered was the, what he called the euthanasia of the rentier. Uh, and then the other line was the socialization of investment. Um, and if we distinguish investment from speculation and just talk, think about investment as a primary market activity rather than a secondary market activity, think in other words of investment as the, the provision of credit in order to finance actual purchases of physical goods, real goods or real services, or more to the point, to finance the actual production of real things that people buy, sell, need, and so forth, say, okay, why don't we have the public itself maybe directly supply credit in those areas, and then let private credit be extended only in the secondary markets, right? Only in this kind of speculative realm. Um, and thereby make, and this, this would have a couple effects. First of all, is it would keep the speculative actors out of the real economy uh, where, they, where they can do harm, where they can do damage, and let them just gamble on their own accounts, so to speak, in the way that people do at Las Vegas, right? Uh, and it would keep the rest of us sort of insulated uh, from the kinds of harms that can be done uh, when speculative manias take over in the secondary markets. And it would also, of course, make a little bit more transparent what is already true, but occluded, which is, again, that basically any time worthwhile credit is being extended, it is ultimately being extended by the public sector anyway. We just hide that fact by saying, oh, it's the banks that are doing it. But we conveniently ignore the fact that the banks are franchisees purveying a public resource, namely the monetized full faith and credit of the United States. That is very, very powerful. Now, Bob, what I want to do is I want to take my favorite clip from the big short, which is the Jenga scene. Okay. I'll let the audience take a look at this momentarily and then circle back having ha said what you just said. Okay. And let's kind of talk about how this would have prevented that. Okay. So here we go. Give me one second to tee this baby up. Have. See what you got. You still have What is it? What? What's this thing? Cologne? No. Opportunity. No. Money. Okay. It's no money. Okay. Chris. This is your basic mortgage bond. All right? The originals were simple. They were just thousands of triple a mortgages bundled together guaranteed by the u.s government the modern ones are different they're private and they're made up of layers of tranches the highest level triple a is getting paid first the lowest rated b is getting paid last taking on defaults first now obviously if you're buying these you can make more money but they're a little risky sometimes they fail chris 
Somewhere along the line, these bees and double bees went from a little risky to dog shit. Where's the trash? I'm talking rock bottom FICO scores. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. The default rates are already up from one to 4%, fellas. And if they rise to 8%, and they will, a lot of these triple bees are going to zero too. And that, you too close, is an opportunity. Okay, you're saying that at 8% the bonds fail and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to eight, it's Armageddon. Yeah. How come nobody's talking about this? You're completely sure of that. Look at him. That's my quant. What? My quantitative, my math specialist, look at him. You notice anything different about him? Look at his face. Look at his eyes. I'll give you a hint. His name's Yang. He won a national math competition in China. He doesn't even speak English. Yeah, I'm sure of the math. Actually, my name's Jiang, and I do speak English. Jared likes to say I don't because he thinks it makes me seem more authentic. I got second in that national math competition. So you're offering us a chance to short this pile of blocks. How? With something called a credit default swap. It's like insurance on the bond. And if it goes bust, you can make 10 to one, even 20 to one return. And it's already slowly going bust. 10 to one, 20 to one. And no one's paying attention. No one is paying attention because the banks are too busy getting paid seeing fees to sell these bonds but wait you are the bank right you work for the bank i bet your margins are pretty nice and fat let's not talk about my margins by the way being nice and fat that's a nice shirt do they make it for men aren't you the bank i work for the bank i don't think like a bank big bank small bank i like to make money all right let me put it this way i'm standing in front of a burning house and i'm offering you fire insurance on it a's zero B's, zero. Double B's, zero. Triple B's, zero. And then that happens. What is that? That's America's housing market. What do you think there, Bob? Oh, hold on. I got you muted. Go oh, ahead, sir. You got me now? Okay, good. So, I mean, this is a perfect illustration uh, in a way of what we were talking about just before we broke for the clip and also what we began to talk about at the front end. Um, so a lot of people don't know this, but up from about 1938, really arguably 1934, but certainly no later than 1938, on up until the mid 1990s, we had an entirely safe and stable housing market. And we actually moved from a country on uh, which fewer than 40% of households own their own homes to being a country where about 66, 65, 66% of American households own their own homes. All of this was done through the extension of public credit and public guarantees of the extensions of private credit, right? It started in 1934 with the Federal, Federal Housing Act, which gave us FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, which offered guarantees of all mortgage loans provided they met certain quality characteristics. So here we have, in a sense, a franchisor exercising quality control. And then of course, the, the picture was sort of completed with 1930, in 1938 with the creation of or the establishment of Fannie Mae, which was designed to make a sort of secondary market, although that's a bit of a stretch to call it a market, but basically to be a secondary buyer of mortgage loans. And so the idea here is that now lots of private banking institutions were willing to extend mortgage credit when they wouldn't have done it before because the public stood behind the loans and guaranteed the banks against any losses on those loans and even was ready to buy them off of the bank's books, again, as long as they were so-called qualifying mortgages. This was an entire, you might think of this as a sort of public, out, a public option where housing finance is concerned. And it was entirely public. And there were no problems in the housing market. There were no, well, of course, there were other kinds of problems, but there were no financial problems in the housing markets. What happens in uh, the 1990s? Well, some private institutions, private investment banking institutions thought, hey, what if we can extend credit to a few more people who wouldn't otherwise have qualified? Another way, another way to say this is 
what if we can extend loans that are crap loans and then package them in securitized pools so we can say, oh, well, we're pooling the risk and so things are less risky and then sell securities that amount to claims on the proceeds that those pools enjoy in the form of mortgage payments on those uh, more marginal loans. Maybe we can make a killing on that. This was all private sector type stuff. None of this was public. None of this was publicly uh, aided or assisted or even publicly approved, right? Uh, and that was the beginning of the so-called private mortgage market or the private securitized mortgage market. And that's it's exactly at that point that the housing bubble really began to move, starting in the mid-1990s, okay? None of this was necessary. And in a certain sense, it was almost by definition a bad idea. Because again, remember, there was a reason that there were conditions attached to the loans, uh, or there were, I'm sorry, conditions attached to the insurance, the mortgage insurance or the guarantee that FHA was willing to extend on mortgage loans. And there were reasons that Fannie limited, right? So essentially attached conditions uh, as a, as a, as a, before they would buy any particular mortgage loans in the secondary market. That meant that basically by definition, any mortgage lending that was done outside of that system was inherently marginal lending and indeed probably exploitative lending, right? Now, if that's, that's problematic obviously in itself, but where it becomes really problematic is when the institutions that do that, the institutions that are sort of outside of the public sector that are doing that, also happen to be institutions on which the private sector depends for primary market credit, right? In other words, if a banking institution, let's say like, is associated with this private sector securitized mortgage lending, if it's associated with this, and it ends up getting into trouble by dint of that association, it's not just the, people, the victims of the exploitative lending who are gonna be victimized, and it's not just the investors in the exploitative products who are gonna be victimized, it's the rest of us too, if we depend on Chase to issue credit, say to small businesses or to issue credit uh, to ordinary folk who need to borrow in order to say buy a car or to do some kind of an upgrade on their home or what have you. Uh, and so that's where the externality comes in, right? So if we had, if we, if we had said, okay, look, if you're gonna do this kind of uh, marginal lending uh, for mortgage lending outside of the public option that we've had since the 1930s, if we had said, okay, we might allow that under some circumstances, but under no circumstances will we allow institutions that the public relies on for primary market credit to be involved in any way with this, then the financial system as a whole and the real economy as a whole would have been insulated against uh, the, the, the aftermath of that bad lending that, that, that went on. But as it, as it is, we didn't do that insulating. Uh, and this is exactly where a kind of Glass-Steagall style of insulation would be called for. Um, although, I, again, I sort of hesitate to say this all because I don't want to be too cavalier about um, saying, well, it was, it's, okay as, it's okay for that exploitative lending to take place as long as it can't come over and affect the rest of us because the exploitation itself is problematic, needless to say. Um, but what I'm saying is uh, it's not only exploitative of the immediate victims, it's exploitative of all of us when the institutions that do it are not insulated from the, uh, the, the, the ordinary primary market credit lending system. Sir, I tell you, this has been a very, very informative uh, interview for me. I mean, most of this stuff is really going to be, I'm going to watch this interview probably five times to learn everything you just said. Very, very eye-opening. Um, what I'd like to do is give you a moment um, because we're right up against the hour. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of close out for folks to understand what may be around the corner, what might be in the immediate you know, because this stuff has already happened. So now let's take a look forward and get a feel for where we need to go, and then we'll close it out. Great, great. So um, maybe I'd say a couple of things. Um, the first is, to uh, it's probably good for all of us to keep in mind that shadow banking is a relative term in the sense, or maybe maybe it's better to say it's a, it's a sort of, it's a functional term rather than a proper name. And what I mean in emphasizing that is to say what would have been shadow banking 10 years ago need not be shadow banking now. And what would not have been shadow banking 10 years ago could very well be shadow banking now, right? So back in the lead up to 2008, there were sort of three primary forms of shadow banking, you might say. 
One was the repo markets, basically the, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. We probably don't have time to define repo market, but let's just say one was the repo markets. Uh, a second uh, was the money market mutual fund and commercial paper uh, markets. And then finally, a third was, of course, the derivative markets. And one thing that Dodd Frank did was to try to bring those three principal elements of the shadow banking sector out of the shadows, so to speak essentially partly commandeer them, have the Fed partly commandeer them, partly turn them into public utilities, and then, of course, attach regulatory restrictions to them as a sort of conditions of the sort of public guarantee that would be afforded those particular uh, sub-industries of the financial services industry. So those pieces of the old shadow banking industry are a little bit less shadowy now than they were then. I think they still we still have to shed a bit more light on them. They're not fully out of the shadows, but they're not nearly as important to look at now as they would have been before 2008. But what that means in turn is that there are other things we should be on the lookout for. We should basically be on the lookout for the next forms of shadow banking and the next speculative assets that will become the objects of speculative fads. I think uh, one obvious place to be looking right now is cryptocurrencies, distributed ledger technologies, all the sort of the whole fintech realm, I think, is probably going to be the realm where the next forms of shadow banking in the classic pre-2008 sense emerge. And that's where the real shadows are right now. And that's where the, the that's where the stupid money is going now, uh, rather than in, in, in mortgage loans. Um, so I hope that the regulators are on the lookout for this. Uh, I'm certainly trying to uh, urge that on them. And I think lots of other people are as well. But that's the first point to make. And I think, you know, Ms. Clinton, uh, I'm glad that she brought up Chapter 15, but it was pretty old news when she first brought it up. Uh, that was, you know, as you know, Paul McCulley had pointed out or sort of drew attention to it and actually canonically named the shadow banking sector way back in 2007. But the funny thing is that the people who finally informed Ms. Clinton in 2015 that there is this, there used to be this thing called shadow banking, were probably thinking of something that was no longer as shadowy by 2015 as it had been before 2008. Precisely because, again, Dodd Frank addresses repo indirectly, at least through Title VIII, addresses derivatives through Title VII, and of course addresses uh, the money market mutual fund and commercial paper industries as well. Um, so that's the first point I would sort of close on. The second, uh, I'm gonna, I want to leave you with a kind of maybe a, a provocative uh, example from history that I think nicely illustrates something we were talking about a moment ago. And that is that, again, I think the public sector can take a much more overt role in the credit extension system than it has been doing in recent decades, right? So again, behind the scenes, it's our credit anyway. The, the, all of the credit out there in the financial system, insofar as it's backed up publicly, is our full faith and credit, yours and mine. It's our collective full faith and credit that's monetized in the form of a national currency, which is itself issued by our own duly constituted federal government uh, instrumentality known as the Fed. So we might as well make that overt uh, instead of leaving it in the shadows, pardon, pardon that use of that word again. And it lest it be thought that that's hard to do or that that's somehow crazy or really wacky or out there. Um, I would encourage everybody to Google uh, uh, the name of one very interesting institution that we had in this country for a long time during the, the 30s and the 40s called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, or the RFC. The RFC in its day was by far the largest financial institution in the entire world. Its balance sheet dwarfed all of the combined balance sheets of the Wall Street institutions, all combined. It was by far the largest credit generating institution, credit extending institution in the world. And it extended uh, loans as small as twenty or thirty dollars to African American barber shops in in certain Los Angeles neighborhoods, to giant mega million or even billion dollar loans for large public infrastructure projects like the Hoover Dam or what have you. And this institution was a public institution. It was a government institution. And indeed, many of its children we still have with us. Fannie Mae was simply a child, a subsidiary of the RFC. Uh, the uh, the Small Business Administration, SBA, which we still have, was a child of RFC. This was, again, by far the world's largest financial institution. It was entirely public. It was the ultimate in public options in the financial sector. I see absolutely no reason why we can't restore a, a modernized, a modern version of that now.
And that would take that would make very transparent to everybody that we don't need Wall Street as a source of credit or as a source of credit extension or credit generation. Uh, and that, I think, would encourage further than uh, belief in this basic proposition I tried to get across, which is that Wall Street could be turned into a pure intermediary uh, sort of sector where they only basically intermediate between private holders of credit. I mean, sorry, private holders of capital and those who want to use it but don't actually generate public credit, which is backed up by the federal government, which can then, of course, end up in credit bubbles and the like. Um, so just if everybody would just Google Reconstruction Finance Corporation or RFC, um, just to sort of uh, see what a, a real public option could look like. Uh, and then I won't mention the uh, the article and white paper that I have out there sort of, um, I, well, I won't, I won't, I won't leave you with, uh, I won't, I won't, advertise uh, in detail my own attempt to sort of sketch a modern version of this. Please do. Let, let, the, let, the old one, let the old one suffice for now. The RFC itself is an incredibly inspiring institution, and we ought to bring back a modern version of it. Very, very good. Bob, this was one of my favorite um, interviews ever. So Great. Thanks, Steve. Thank you so much. I hope you'll come back. I really do. I want to be able to do this again and again, because this is so informative. And, and I think that as long as we provide a service to the people and they continue to find value in it, I think we should continue to do it. This is beautiful. Thanks, Steve. Happy to do it anytime. And thank you so much for doing this, for running this series. This is one of the greatest things out there on the web. I, I watch every one of them. And thanks so much for doing it. And please never stop. And I'm happy to help out anytime. Oh, my God. Thank you so much, sir. I really <laughs> appreciate it. You All right. It. Have a good day, Bob. Thank you okay. so much. You, Steve. All right, Bye. folks. With that, I'm going to say goodbye to Bob, say goodbye to you all. Have a great day, everyone.